you with me if you would go that uh, just singing he's engaged to Danielle on the piano he's been our one of our summer interns this summer and been a great blessing to our bus ministry our teen soul winning and our ministry in general so thankful for young men with a heart he's uh, he and Danielle are joining before long with Micah and Ariana Bull going to Japan as missionaries and so what a great thing to have our young people with a heart for God and a heart for the world. 2 Timothy chapter 4 in your Bibles. 2 Timothy chapter 4. To many people the victorious Christian life is having enough money to pay your bills, having kids that are pretty decent, and um, having some friends and not being in trouble with the law or the IRS or whatever. And they call that God being good to us. This morning, I want to talk to you about the essence of the Christian life or the most simple things for successful and victorious Christianity. What is it that your Christian life is truly all about? Yes, your Christian life, I mean, it's all about being saved and going to heaven. We're not going to question that. But once you're saved and going to heaven, if you don't know for sure you're saved and going to heaven, we could take care of that today. Jesus saves. It doesn't take but a moment to trust Christ as Savior. But what about the Christian life after that? What is it that essence? What are those root things that put it all together? We're going to start in 2 Timothy 4. And actually, I prepared this sermon for tonight. So once in a while, a night sermon gets brought in the morning, and they are different. So you that are only here on mornings now and then, just hang on. It'll be okay. Next Sunday's coming, and I'll be back to normal. Let's stand for a moment. Maybe flip your phone off, if you don't mind, and um, put it away somewhere and look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. The Apostle Paul's nearing the end of his life. He's in prison. And he's written much of our New Testament, and he's telling Timothy, the young preacher, about just some things he wants him to do and to remember. Now, in 2 Timothy 4, 7, Paul's, his last words almost, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. If you keep your Bible open there and we'll pray. Father, bless your word. Help us control the distractions in our mind and around us. And we ask you to teach us today that we might be more of what we could be so that we'll enjoy what we will be. For your glory, Father. Amen. You can be seated. Keep your Bible open there quickly. And I'm going to run through a lot of scripture. If you can't keep up with me, please listen. I'd rather you listen than thumb through not being able to find verses. But Paul says there in verse 7, three things. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. So um, keeping the faith, keeping believing what you believe. You young people in here, you've grown up with it. Many of you have been in Sunday school much of your life, all of your life. You've heard it. You've seen it. You've been around it. And Paul said, I kept it my whole life. I've hung on to it. He said, I've fought a good fight. Why? Because it's a fight to keep the faith. This world's working at trying to destroy your faith. And, and your own burdens will try to destroy your faith. And, and your own mistakes, things you've done wrong, your own sin. But he said, I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. That means there's something God's got for you to do. doesn't matter who you are. If you got saved today, if you're, not, if you're not saved now and you're going to get saved in an hour, God's got a plan for your life. That's your course. It's what God's called you to do. And so Paul said there's three things. Number one, I fought a good fight. Number two, I finished my course. Number three, I've kept the faith. But there's not a period at the end of that sentence. I want you to notice what he says in verse 8. Henceforth, because I fought a good fight, because I finished my course, because I kept the faith, there's something going to happen. Let's read verse 8 again. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Crowns symbolizing rewards that are going to come, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Now stick with me for a minute, and on this side of the platform we're going to talk about this being you get saved, all right? Um, at some point in time, 
If you don't get born again, you're going to die and go to hell. It doesn't mean being a Baptist. It just means trusting Jesus as your Savior. It means you're not going to trust all the gods. You're going to trust the Savior. It means you're not going to trust being good. You're not going to be trust being baptized. You're not going to trust being confirmed or going to catechism. There comes a point in time when you realize, uh, I realized I was a sinner and I deserved to die and go to hell. Christ died for me and I was going to put my faith in Jesus and in Jesus alone and no one else but the blood of Christ to cleanse me of my sin. And the Bible says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. That's this side of the platform. Now, we've got to separate this because we too often mix works and salvation. Half the religions in the world, or probably more than that, half the Christian circles in America throw works over here. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, the Bible says, but according to his mercy, he saved me. I am not saved by works. I'm saved by grace. I'm saved by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross end of subject my name's in the book of life i'm on my way to heaven this side of the platform we're going to talk about works where, where do works fit in it and we're going to look at some scripture but most of what we're going to talk about is what these works produce at the end of the story so over here i'm born dead in trespasses and sin i'm born a uh, prone to sin no one had to teach me to lie no one had to teach me to cheat no one had to teach me to be selfish and then i came a point in my life when i realized i was a lost sinner without christ and i needed to be born again and at 18 years old i trusted christ as my savior in a city park i put my faith in him i was saved i was baptized back there as a baby but all that does is get the kid's head wet and uh, I wasn't baptized. The word baptized means immerse. I was sprinkled in the Lutheran church. And uh, that's certainly anything but saving grace. There's no grace in water. There's grace in the blood. And so I trusted Jesus, born again. Then I was baptized. It took about a year to get baptized. By the way, if you get saved, you ought to get baptized. But I didn't know that. No one told me. The guy led me to Christ. He left for, school, for college the next day. I left for college three days later. I started reading my Bible every day from that Saturday to this. Never been a day I've not read my Bible. And, uh, but uh, after about a year, I realized, you know, this baptism thing's all over the Bible. I know I'm saved. Now, what about this baptism? So I went to the pastor at this church that I was visiting when I was back out. Of, uh, I was at college, but I went back around home and went to a friend's church. I said, what about this baptism thing? He said, yeah, if you get saved, you should get baptized like your wedding ring. You make your vows, and then you put the ring on to show you've made the vows. And it's a public statement of an internal private faith. And I said, well, I need to do that. And so that summer, I got baptized. About 20 of us, in fact. All young people got baptized. College age and high school young people got baptized. So those were all, this is what got me saved, salvation. I got baptized, and I began to grow. One day, I'll see Jesus. Now, follow me as we look at the scripture this morning. He says in verse 18, I have fought a good, or in verse 7, I'm sorry, verse 18, 1 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 4, 7, I've fought a good fight, I've finished my course, I've kept the faith. Now, there's some fighting and some wrestling and some working going on in there, and because of that, because of what he did faithfully for God, verse 8, henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. Here's the Christian life. The Christian life today should be completely about tomorrow. The Christian life today ought to be lived completely about tomorrow. And I'm going to give you a Bible study this morning quickly. And, if you, and probably you may not be able to keep up. Just write the references down and look them up. But I want to explain some things to you. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And every man will receive for the things done in his body. Now, we're not talking about salvation. The judgment seat of Christ is for the believer. The great white throne judgment in Revelation 21 is for the unbeliever. That has to do with them going to hell and their punishment. But my sins are gone, washed in the blood of the Lamb. So I'm going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ where my works will be rewarded Follow me quickly as we look at the scripture. Mark Matthew 6, 19. Just write the reference down. You know the verse. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. 
Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Matthew 6, 19 and 20. Today, you are laying up for yourselves treasures on earth, or you're laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now, that's the bottom line. Let me explain something to you young people. We've got a bunch of teenagers here. George, are any Servines here? They already leave. I think they're there on the road already. They were in Sunday school, but George and uh, Adam are going back to Bible college. George is going um, to graduate this year if he passes classes, which doesn't always happen. Don't, the world doesn't fall apart when you drop a class in college. But um, other young people are leaving this week and next week. I think, Caleb, this, next week so you're going you're gonna to head back. Happy three weeks home or whatever you got out of it. But anyway, um, Brianna, you're the one who got a week and a half at home. But they're going to school. But you know what, you single young people, you want to get married. You know what you want when you get married? You want somebody that loves you as much as you love you. That's who you pick out to marry. If I could find a girl who loves me as much as I love me, I'm taking that one. But once she gets to know me better, she won't like me nearly as much as I like me. That's just life. But understand this. I'm just being candid. You can call this anything you want. But when I was getting serious with my wife, I asked myself, is she the one I want to serve God with? Is she going where I'm going? Does she want what I want? Does she have the same passion in life I do? And I had no question in my mind I wanted to serve God. I was in Bible college. I was going to go into the ministry. I thought I was going to be a missionary and go overseas. And we talked, and I listened, and I paid attention. Yes, she thought I was awesome, but that's obvious. But, but, but more than that, I wanted her to have a heart for God. Can I just say something? Throw something out to you that are very faithful to hear all the time. Some of you whose husbands are busy serving God, ladies, you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. See, when my husband teaches class, exactly, he will stand and you will stand individually. I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus, who died upon the cruel tree? That's a not-so-nice commercial, but it's a reality, ladies. Can I say this? Men, you that have, that have godly wives that are busy for God, you will stand alone before the judgment seat of Christ. That every man will give an account of himself can I say this you that are perhaps you're not saved this morning you won't stand before the judgment seat of Christ you will stand before the great right great white throne and we're not going to turn there you mean we may get there but I doubt it will get that far and the ones who are saved go to heaven and are rewarded for their works the ones who are lost go to hell and are judged according to their works but it's all settled by what you do over here with the blood of Christ when you put your faith in Jesus, not the pastor, not the church, not the baptism, not anything else, but just Jesus alone. When you put your faith in Christ, you're born again. And then you set out to do something. And I wasn't going to marry a girl who was going to be an anchor to me and keep me from facing God the way I wanted to face God. I was going to marry a girl who was, we we're going to run together for the King of Kings. And we are going to have a life that would glorify God and a life that would make an impact for God. And I had no intention of my life piling up president pictures and piling up cars and houses and lands and one day stand facing Jesus with nothing. I could title the sermon, Flat Busted in Heaven. He says in Matthew chapter 6, I read earlier, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Are you laying up treasures in heaven? Because if you're saved, you're going to go there. You don't want to be broke. Colossians chapter 1 verse 5, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you have heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. There's a hope that you lay up in heaven. Let's make this clear. We will face eternity. We will be rewarded. We will stand we will bow before the Savior. We will have been rewarded according to our works. And Romans 14, 12, if you're scribbling notes, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Individually, I will stand before God, me, alone. Sometime before or after, my wife will stand before God. Sometime before or after, my son that led the teen choir, he'll stand before God. His wife, Carly over here, she'll stand before God. My children, my daughters, Esther and Hannah, individually will stand before God. My son Josiah down in Trinidad, uh, right now, he'll stand before God. And every one of us are going to give an account 
of ourselves. Please don't talk, young people. Hey, don't talk. Everyone, you're going to give an account. And you can leave right now. Or you can sober up. Because I didn't come here to have you ignore me. I am going to stand before God for what you hear. Go on. Come on up here. Yeah, you. Come on up. Sit here by Mr. Sandberg. Right now. Move. Hey, come on. Come on. The whole church is waiting on you, buddy. Have some respect. And you don't need to come back again. We don't pay for buses and pay for fuel to have you come keep your friends from listening to me. Do you understand? There's a lot of money spent to put you here, and you're not going to ignore it. You're not going to disrupt a whole church full of people for you. I'm not going to have that here. It's real easy for me to just say, you don't ride a bus anymore. This church bought those buses, fueled those buses, pays to face the, the inspectors in those buses, so we can give you a chance, because you will face God one day. Either going to hell or going to heaven. The call's yours. 100% yours. And by the way, all of us say, well, you're being mean. I've been to his house over and over. I know him more than you know him. Trust me, it's okay. Somebody's got to love people enough to tell them the truth. By the way, if we had a nation full of people who would tell folks the truth, instead of saying we owe you something and you've not been treated right, and because of your color or your background or your economy, you, woe is you. Hey, woe is you nothing. You're in America. You're in the greatest nation on the face of the earth. You've got every chance in the world. What's wrong with us? My goodness, get a job, get a life, go to work, live for others and get off your lazy backside and have a life that counts for God. You say, wow, I never heard preachers preach like that. You don't come back on Sunday night. First John chapter 2, write it down. Now we just delayed the sermon 10 minutes here. First John 2, 28. He says, and now little children abide in him that when he shall appear, listen, that we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Can I tell you, there are people who will face Jesus Christ and be thoroughly and totally ashamed. See, man, I didn't come to hear this. Talk to God. You're the one who came here. You could have gone to any other church in town and had a praise and worship service where you swayed and sung kumbaya and they didn't warn you of the wrath to come. And I don't believe in accidents. You're here on purpose. I'm here on purpose. Bob Gray, you could have come last week when Bob Gray preached a nice sermon on troubles. It's your fault for coming this week instead of last week. He says, let me read it again. 1 John 2, 28, now little children abide in him. The command is to abide in Christ, to walk with him, to know him, to read his word, to love him, that when he shall appear, we may, be, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Could you see it? You're a Christian. You're sitting there on Saturday afternoon with your beer and your sports section. You haven't been at church in a month or two and you have never taught your children anything out of the Word of God and Jesus comes tell me you're not going to be ashamed you got saved when you were young you know for sure you're saved but your wife's not or your husband's not and sadly your children aren't How do we stand at the judgment seat of Christ on our way to heaven knowing our children will be at the great white throne going to hell? I can't even fathom it. It's beyond me. I can't even imagine. Now my children have to choose Christ or not, but I'll tell you what, they're going to hear the Bible read to them every day and they're going to be in Sunday school and they're going to be in church because my children and my grandchildren will sit, stand, fall before the throne of an almighty God and they're going to face God and the hell, fire, and damnation kind of preaching America was reared on has stopped in America because we all want to feel good about ourselves. Could I tell you something? When Christ comes, everyone will not feel good about themselves. No more than the people who don't prepare for retirement are not going to feel good about trying to live on soul security that's already been spent. 
Some of you that are so together financially, you just think you can't even fathom people who are not prepared to retire. I can't believe you're not prepared for your eternal retirement. Have we taught a Sunday school class? Have we given any of our money to the work of God? Have we witnessed to the lost? Have we loved on a widow? Have we visited the orphaned and the fatherless? Have we cared about a lost world without Christ? Somebody's got to care. Amos chapter 4 verse 12. Amos 4 12. Therefore thus will I do to thee, O Israel, and because I will do this to thee, prepare to meet thy God. My job as a pastor, I believe, is to help prepare you to meet your God. I just think of all the jobs this morning, my battery must be running low, it's got a red light on, but I think this morning there were bus drivers got here early to drive a bus. You know what? God notices that and God always pays his workers. There were bus workers and bus drivers that were here by 6.15 this morning. And there were bus captains who cared for the responsibility of visiting and picking up kids. There were bus mechanics who took their time, their money, and their, their, uh, their sweat and blood and knuckles bleeding to keep those buses going. There were young people and adults who went out house to house to house picking up people and trying to get them to Christ. Now what they do with Jesus is up to them, but we can at least try to get them to church and to get them to hear the gospel. There are people yesterday at our jails, people today going to be in jails and rest homes from our church getting the gospel out. And I've tried to open up doors so everybody in our church, this person works in a jail and this person works in a rest home and this person works in a bus and this person teaches Sunday school. You know what my job is? My job to prepare you to meet your God because you will we meet Jesus one day you will stand before God fall prostrate before the prostrate before the throne of God and at that hour nothing on this earth will matter your houses and your lands your health people dumb people say you got your health you've got everything if you've got your health and go to hell you will wish that you'd never had an ounce of health but it had Jesus instead Oh, if I could just find my way to enough money so I didn't have to go to work. Oh, don't worry about that. Find your way to make a difference for God. Take your life. Just what has our life done for God? Could I tell you this morning, Mark chapter 8, verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Do you understand when Jesus sees some people, he's ashamed of them. And we're not talking about unsaved people here. Because the unsaved are a totally different judgment. Jesus sees people, you are ashamed to mention that you went to church. You are ashamed to tell your friends at work that you were married and that you love God and that you and your wife went to Sunday school. You are ashamed to tell your relatives at a family gathering that there's a God in heaven. You are ashamed to bow your head in prayer, thanking God for the food that you've had. You're ashamed that your neighbors know that you go to church. You don't want to put a tie on. My goodness, they'll think I'm a freak. And I don't care if you wear a tie or not. But I just think God deserves my best. And uh, I want God to have the very best of me. Uh, my neighbors this morning, pulling out of my driveway, I waved at neighbors on the driveway. You know what? Every one of my neighbors knew what I was doing. They knew I was a single guy going to church. <laughs> the four of us take four cars to church. How does that work out? I don't get it. <laughs> we all go at different times. You know what? We never have to tell each other to hurry up either. <laughs> who, have you, who have you talked to? Go didn't it would go and I didn't coordinate this, but have we told the world about Jesus? The one around the corner, the one across the world. Colossians chapter three. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him. And you know, we have this stupid idea of heaven like we're gonna have wings and halos and float around playing a harp. You know how boring that would get? That's a stupid idea. The book of Revelation says we will reign and rule with Christ. Remember the story? Doled out the investments to people, and this guy took his ten and made ten more. This guy took his five, made five more. This guy took his one, put under a rock. And this guy, he said, rule, be thou ruler over ten cities, and be thou ruler over five cities. He's talking about the eternal kingdom. And there are people who are going to reign and rule under God himself. Because of their faithfulness today, they will reign and rule with Jesus tomorrow. And if we do nothing for God, we're going to have nothing 
when we get there. First Timothy 6.14 That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. I for one do not want my children to go to hell. But I don't want my children to go before God empty handed. In your hymnal there's a song, must I meet him empty handed? Must I meet the Savior so? I don't care what kind of college degree you have. I care whether you've told someone about Jesus recently. Have you taken time to bow your head in prayer just to tell God he's good? Have we taken some of the money God? Do you understand we're rich? You understand we're rich, right? You say, oh, I'm a college student. I'm not rich. Oh, you're so rich. If you bought Starbucks this week, you're rich. If you bought cigarettes this week, you're rich. If you bought $3, $4 gallon gasoline, you're rich. We are so rich. Living in a two or three or $4,000 a month retirement home, you are so rich. The retired in most of the world live in a back bedroom without any place to go, without food to eat. We are rich. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9 Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart. He's mocking. Walk in the ways of thine heart, in the sight of thine eyes, but know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. And you can run off and play the fool in your youth and, and enjoy the physical relationships with the young ladies and, and you can enjoy the party life and you can enjoy the world, but could I tell you, you will face God one day. Matthew 12, 36, but I say unto you that every idle, man, idle word that man shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Idle words, idle activities, idle morality. Matthew 18, 23, therefore the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And he goes on to tell the story. He's going to take an account of his servants. And God is going to come along to each one of us, me included. What have I given you, Bruce Goddard? And what have you done with it? And what have I given you? And what did you do with it? And what have I given you? And what have you done with it? And he won't be looking at your IRA. And he won't be looking at your car or your house. And he won't look. God paves the streets with gold. God's not impressed that you and I have a bank account with money in it. Amen. Two things you can bring from earth to heaven. The souls of men and the word of God in your heart. That's it. And those little children over there, you pray, oh, you nursery workers, you pray over those little ones, those babies, and those two and three-year-olds, and you pray for them and pray for their parents. God knows you've taken time to pray and go before God on behalf of lost souls being saved. And you take that four- and five-year-old, and you bring them up, teach them the Word of God and the love of Christ, and then you teach that five-, six-, seven-year-old class, and as these children grow up from nursery, someone's praying for them. And in preschool, someone's praying for them. In first, second, third, fourth grade, someone's praying for them. And along the way, someone where it hits a kid's heart God loves me what an incredible thing and I'm a sinner and why would God love a sinner like me and those teachers and those nursery workers that have prayed and, and taught and bathed that child's class in prayer and prayed over them and, and by the way spend money on your class you can afford everybody here's got enough money to spend money on our class these kids there's nothing better to invest in than the souls of men and at some point along the way, first grade, fifth grade, that kid says, Jesus, I want you to save me. And the Bible says there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents. And up in heaven, God's happy. The angels are happy. And you just go on. You don't have any, any idea what's going on, but I'll tell you what. You are laying up treasures for yourself in heaven. That missionary that gets that money that we pool together as we all give to missions and we send it across the world to these missionaries and hundreds and thousands of people hear the gospel of Christ and whether they receive Christ or not, you and I have been obedient. We have taken the gospel and carried it off to the world. I don't know if I'm doing everything right, but I know with all my heart I want to preach and write and teach and urge folks to righteousness. Look at, look at Psalms chapter 40 with me. Right in the middle of your Bible, the book of Psalms, look at chapter 40. I don't know how I could be more passionate or too passionate. Psalm chapter 40, 
People say, I'm not, I'm not used to a pastor being that intense. You don't mind the athletes being intense. You don't mind politicians being intense. You know what? They've got nothing to do with eternity. What we're doing here, this has to do with eternity. Some people are going to go to hell because they never heard the gospel. Psalm chapter 4, 0, Psalm 40. And those who are going to heaven, could I warn you, you will meet a judgment seat. We're not communists. We are not going into heaven all even Stephen. We will be rewarded according to what we have done for God, not for this world. Psalm chapter 40, look at verse 9. You young men, and bear with me, we've got a lot of young men here who'd like to be in the ministry. Let's look at chapter 40, verse 9. The testimony of the preacher, I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I've not refrained my lips. O Lord, thou knowest. I've not hid thy righteousness. He repeats again. What is he preaching? Righteousness. Psalm 40 verse 10. I've not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I've declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. This preacher steps up and says, God, I'm not doing all right, but you know I've lifted up righteousness. You know I've lifted up truth and honor and dignity and decency. And I've lifted up the glory of God. And God, I've done my best to do that. And God promises He'll go with you. 1 Timothy 6.19, he says, laying up, 1 Timothy 6.19, laying up for themselves, store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. You can lay up a store. In my mom's house, you can go to my mom's house because she's a farm girl. There's canned peaches. There's, you know, why do you can peaches when you can go to the store for a buck and buy them? Because she has a peach tree. And there's cans of food and, and guarantee there's stuff in the fridge and stuff in the freezer. And we could all go to my mom's and eat right now, I'm sure. That's just how farm girls are raised. A store room. Could I tell you we are to lay up a store in heaven? You know what? We have a teen choir. For one, they, they sound good. And most of them don't sleep during the preaching. We want these young people to prepare to serve God with their lives. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.5 And if a man also strive for the masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. And every man that striveth for the ministry is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. 1 Corinthians 9.25 says that like an athlete works out and works out and works out and one day gets that ring or gets that, that uh, trophy, we invest in an eternal crown that will never fade away. They say Super Bowl rings are worth, I forget what somebody said, two to three hundred dollars on eBay. Guy spends his lifetime to earn a Super Bowl ring. Can I tell you something? The lady teaching the four and five year olds will have the worth of 10,000 Super Bowl rings when she gets to heaven. That person who works on a Sunday school bus and goes out to the broken homes and the hurting homes and loves on young people and tries to get them saved. Look, you don't think they're going to get to heaven and God's going to look at them and say, man, that was awesome. You got on that hot bus every week. What kind of fool are you? No, God, God loves those who love his work. And God will not leave you without payday. Every gospel track you pass out, every person you reach in your pocket or your purse and say, can I tell you, Jesus loves you. In the back of this gospel track, it'll tell you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven one day. And you walk away and God says, he's not ashamed of me. The grandkids come to visit and you say, kids, before bed, let's read the Bible. And you read them a Bible story about David and Goliath or Jonah and the whale. And you tell them of the love of God. And those kids grew up thinking... Man, Grandpa, he's a real crazy man. He goes to church all the time. And up in heaven, God's saying, I'm sure proud of that old man. The essence of the Christian life is that we will all stand before the judgment seat. Revelation 4, 4. Let me just read it for you and I'll close. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Could I tell you something? If you're saved, if back here somewhere along the line you trusted Jesus, 
and you began to live for him every good work for God you've done. It's laid up there. You've loved on the widow and the fatherless. You've cared for the poor and the needy. You've given the gospel to people in need. You've taught a Sunday school class. You've helped out those in prison or those in the convalescent. It's all being stored up and stored up and stored up. This is way better than matching funds. This is way better than a 401k. And one day we will be in heaven and we will be shocked beyond words. You'll fall on your face with along with me and we'll say, whoa, this is scary. And God will be on his throne. And you read about it in Revelation 4. There's a rainbow. There's four angelic beasts flying around the, the throne day and night saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. There'll be 10,000 times 10,000 of believers throughout the, the years. And angels by the millions. And we'll cry out, Thou art worthy, O God. Do you want to be there empty-handed? Do you, want us, do you want your children to miss it? The pictures of church history we were looking at before the service, I saw Gary Jefferson up there in one. That's a rich man. Not rich on earth, rich in eternity. And we must all appear. Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed unto men once to die. And after that, the judgment. I don't fear death because I'm well. When I'm about to die, I'm sure I'll fear death because we all do. But I'll tell you what, what scares me now is the thought of displeasing the God who will set my eternal destiny. I know I'm going to heaven. I'm not worried about that. But forever and ever. My role in his kingdom is based on my faithfulness to him today. And I would be an unjust pastor to not warn you. Do something for God with your life. Read your Bible. Read it to your children. Witness to people in your path. Use your money, some of your money for God. Care for others in your community. Somewhere along this life, do something so you can not be dead broke when you see Jesus. And by all means, don't let someone you love go to hell. That is wicked. Let's pray. Father, bless us this morning. Very sobering truth, but it's through the scripture. We could have looked for hours at scripture, warning of a, the time when we'll face an eternal kingdom. Would you help us today to realize that what we do for you matters? Only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. No one will walk heavenly streets proud because of what they drove, but they will be thankful for what they gave and for who they loved, for who they invested in. They'll be thankful, we'll be thankful for every time we spoke of Jesus' love. We'll be grateful for every time we talk to people about a, a God in heaven who so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. May we, may we be openly confident of our faith. May we be openly proud of our salvation. May we talk about it. Because one day we will see you face to face. Help us to make our choices with eternity in mind. The essence of our Christian life is not a building full of people today but bowing alone before a judgment seat one day. Bless us. If someone here is not saved, I pray you'd help them get saved. May they fear the wrath to come. And then may we all work diligently for the rewards to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together with our heads bowed. Take a moment, would you? Just you talk to God. It's all about you and the Lord. If you're not sure heaven's...